Yo, what's up? Jonah, where are you? I'm walking. Dude, we have a podcast recording coming up in like two minutes. No, Andy no, Murphy no. Murphy Paul's going to be on to talk about the extended mind. No, 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 no. It's, it's in an hour. No, it's now, dude. Two minutes, not two hours. It's now. No way. Yes way. You know what the funny thing is? Is I decided to do this walk because of the book. Because of that whole chapter on what? how our body is so tied to cognition. And I and get capacities. the restorative value of going out for a walk. But, you know, sometimes when you're spelling the roses, it doesn't add to your punctuality. No, it doesn't. But you know what it does do? Provide other environments and natural environments by which your mind is able to expand. and We process can talk like about this during the podcast, all right? We can talk about building relationships with people and the the importance of space and the environment and the importance of emotion, the body in our thinking processes. But you actually gotta be here to do the podcast, dude. So get in your house and get in your chair and hit the record button. You gotta take a quick shower. All right? Shower. That could be a new thing, podcast from the shower. All right, Annie Murphy Paul, uh, author of The Extended Mind, which Joda and I loved reading, and uh, we invite our audience to to read that book too, and it inspired us to invite you on the show, which we are super pleased to have you here. But I have to say, I found one part of your book very disappointing. Uh, it was when I discovered that I had not come up with the phrase, I feel, therefore I am, in response to Descartes, I think, therefore I am. I thought I'd come up with that novel expression but you uh, told me otherwise. And setting my bruised ego aside, why, why <laughs> easy, is though. feeling... It's easy to hurt his ego. Though. It is. Yeah. It is very easy to hurt my ego. <laughs> so why is feeling so important to thinking? Well, uh, hi, Dan. Hi, Joda. It's good to be here. And, and Dan, I mean, I think um, a good idea is a good idea because it springs up in lots of minds, right? And I think you were, I'm sure you were drawing that idea from from your own experience, which is where the the extended mind really starts. And we'll get into that in our conversation here today. But um, why is feeling so important to thinking? You know, I think um, in a lot of ways, the extended mind is a critique of our culture. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's psychological in the sense that it helps us understand how our own minds work, but it also helps us understand, I think, um, the limits of the ideas that we've received from our culture. And one of the um, most enduring and most sort of powerful ideas that we have in our culture is that mind and body are separate, uh, thinking and feeling are separate, and actually that mind and thinking are somehow superior, you know, that they're sort of elevated above this grubby animal body that we have. And um, the thing I like about the idea of the extended mind is that it, it corrects that misimpression. It says, no, actually, to be full human beings, to be, uh, to think as intelligently as we are capable of, requires us to draw on all of our, um, all of our, the aspects of our humanity, which definitely include our bodies, our emotions, um, our relationships with other people, the, the physical surroundings in which we find ourselves. Um, and all of those things get left out in this model of thinking that imagines that it all happens up here, that it all goes on inside the brain. So I think, I think of the extended mind as a kind of necessary corrective to some very um, misinformed ideas about uh, how thinking works, and indeed, like who we are as people. We're not just sort of brains on brains on legs or a brain in a vat, as uh, as philosophers like to say. We're we're so much more than that. Yeah, well, that's a great uh, beginning to this conversation. I, I think that in, in light of the rise of AI, I think this is going to be an important conversation, mm -hmm. and maybe we can weave some of that in. But, folks, we are here with Annie Murphy Paul, uh, who is an acclaimed writer, a science writer who's had been published in the New York Times, Scientific American, the best American science writing. Uh, she's also um, a senior writer, writer at The Hidden Mind on uh, NPR and has written, again, The Extended Mind, which we're talking about today. So, welcome, Annie. Oh, thanks. Thanks. I'm so happy to be here. How in how important is it that we we map um, our learning, our intake to our body? How mm -hmm. wh what's that relationship? I mean, how how what, what's the importance there and the relevance? Yeah, 
Well, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier about how um, our culture encourages us to think of ourselves as brains uh, that happen to have a body that kind of carries our brain around, you know, and I think that uh, that's even more the case these days as we become more and more dependent on technology. I think a lot of people felt during the pandemic that they were kind of reduced to, you know, we, we became these brains in boxes, these heads in boxes on, on Zoom as we are right now. But um, <laughs> and, uh, it's very easy to forget that um, we're, we're really bodies first, I think, you know, that that's what I've come to think as uh, over the years that I've been um, researching and reporting and thinking about the extended mind, we're really bodies first. And there's so many ways many of which I discuss in the book, in which our bodies are smarter or more rational even, or get to an answer faster than our brains do. And of course the the body, the brain is part of the body. So I don't I don't want to be reifying this sort of split that is uh, that is is so dominant in our culture. But um to the extent that um we do sep- we do separate in our imaginations mind and body we tend to think that the body doesn't have anything to contribute to intelligent thinking and in the various chapters of the extended mind i try to take that apart to deconstruct that idea and construct a new notion of how of the many ways that the body informs our thinking and can make us more intelligent things like uh, paying attention to our interoceptive sense. That's this flow of feeling uh, that's constantly present, but that we often ignore or kind of set aside this flow of sensation and feeling inside our bodies or gesture, you know, the way we Mm -hmm. move our hands and how that um, is actually an extension of our thinking and an augmentation of our thinking and um, physical movement, you know, um, walking and running and um, exercising and all these things that we imagine I, I, it always sort of amuses me how we think that physical activity should be separate from and happen before or after our work day or our school day. You know, it's like, well, I'll go to the gym after work, you know, or kids can take a break in the middle of the day and have recess. But right. when we're really thinking and really doing serious mental work, we have to sit still. You know, we have to like restrain our bodies from moving when really, if you look at the um, at our evolutionary history, human beings evolved thinking and moving at the same time. These very complex activities like foraging and hunting involved very complex physical movements and very complex cognitive activities at the same time. And we're actually, we actually evolved to have those two, two tracks going at the same time, you know? So um, to me, um, we should start with the body and then kind of and 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 recognize that it gets there first in a lot of ways and that the brain is kind of always trailing behind instead of imagining that um the brain can do it all on its own yeah there's so much to unpack in what you just said (laughs) i I work in higher education and i remember watching a ted talk where the and i forget who the speaker was but he was saying that Basically, in higher ed, you have a lot of professors who are like balloon heads just floating down the hallways, <laughs> completely detached from their bodies. And it's kind of how we've set up our education system, which you speak about in your book, too. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we have this mentality of, okay, you sit there with a textbook and study it, and there's lectures happening. You're supposed to absorb this information. But increasingly, we're finding that active learning is really where it's at and modeling and being able to get hands on even with complex abstract cognitive stuff right mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. so i think that's pretty fascinating too in terms of in terms of learning um yeah and so i guess you know to that physical part should more le- and because this is a leadership podcast too we talk about leadership and sense making should we, we as leaders should we be thinking about that when we're um organizing or organizations should leaders be taking more walks instead of sitting around a boardroom table should we take a walk down the street and have a conversation instead oh i absolutely think so and there's there's a number of reasons why that's the case you know there's the one that i just mentioned that uh, physical movement is actually a facilitative of of good thinking um just in the sense of of moving our bodies, um, getting that energized, alert kind of feeling that we have when we're moving, as opposed to when we're kind of 
sleepily or drowsily sitting at um, our desks or at a, around a conference table. But then there's also the fact that usually we're walking outside and right. being in nature is, you know, is something I write about in the extended mind. Being in nature has this amazing attention restoration effect whereby just by kind of allowing our attention to diffusely and um, in a relaxed kind of open-minded way, peruse what we see around us when we're outside. That's, it's a great way to um, restore, like refill the attentional tank that gets drained when we're working so hard and uh, staring at a screen or staring at little symbols on a, on a page, you know? And then thirdly, uh, when we move with people, you know, and, and it's very interesting, people tend to fall into a synchronous movement when they're walking side by side. They tend to um, take steps at the same time. That's just something we do naturally. And research has found that when we move in the same way at the same time as another person, that makes it easier to make a mental connection with them, to feel like we're on the same page, to feel like we can be cooperative and um, and sort of... Uh, uh, of a single mind in a way, you know, and, and there's even that effect is even more powerful um, if there's a whole bunch of people moving um, in synchron in a synchronous way, like at a, at a rave, for example. I'm not going to suggest right. that that, um, that leaders. I like raves. <laughs> and certainly, taking a walk with someone else is a great way to sort of um, establish some common ground. Is is there um. Well, actually, I have an anecdote to that. I mean, I remember when I used to, back in the day, um, I would do a little coding. And as anybody who does coding, something either works or doesn't work when you're coding. There's mm -hmm. no there's no sloppiness in there. Mm -hmm. And I would get up and walk around. Um, I would get up and go, okay, I'm going to walk and mm -hmm. uh, clear my mind. And sure enough, it, the mm -hmm. benefits were so um, obvious to me mm -hmm. that I was ex I, I actually anticipated um, results from the effort, if that makes any sense. I mean, I was like, I'm going to walk and get results. Like I, I, I got such good feed. It, that was just the way I internalized it. Yeah. But I'll say this. I also felt guilty while I did it. Mm -hmm. And I, that's kind of where I'm like, where my question is, is mm -hmm. it was, what, what's, what modified our, our, our world to the point where we feel is, was there, is there something that structurally has occurred that made it so that we kind of decided to ignore this co-breathing conspire, I guess would be the word. I don't know. This 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 yeah. this shared sort of experience of mind. Is there something yeah. that, that that's occurred in the past thousand, fifty, or whatever years? Uh, well, if I were to nominate any event, you know, uh, um, in terms of being responsible for that very constricted and limiting notion of productivity, you know, that you're only really being productive if you're sitting alone, quietly, still at your desk, you know, which is, I think, the the limiting notion, um, um, Joda, that made you feel guilty when you were taking a walk, even though you know that if when you take a walk, that problem gets solved, you know, uh, from your own experience that that's, you know, that's going to happen. I would nominate the cognitive revolution of the middle of the 20th century mm -hmm. when um, researchers, scientists started thinking about the brain as a computer, you know, and that was a very fruitful um, analogy and that's all it is it's it's a comparison of two things that are very unlike it did produce a lot of um advances a lot of brilliant insights but i think um we took it too far and um and it, it took on a life of its own in our in our culture and in our, and in our society in the sense that we started expecting our brains to operate like computers we started to imagine that um that our brains are sort of information processing machines and the way that they work is that you you feed information in and it kind of chugs along and then it spits information out or it spits the answer out and of course the brain is in a thousand ways not like a computer you know it's um it's an evolved biological organ that um evolved to do things quite different from what we expect it to do in our modern um knowledge based world you know it it um it actually evolved to do things like sense and feel the body you know navigate through physical space interact with other people all these things that we tend to push aside when we think we need to get real work done and my contention in the extended mind is that we need to make our work and our learning 
more con- much more congruent with what the brain actually evolved to do. We need to sort of put all that stuff back into um, our learning and our work and bring the body yeah. and the physical, our physical surroundings and our relationships back into the process of thinking in those settings of, of school and work. Thinking about what we just said about the industrial, basically the industrial revolution and through the middle of the, middle of the 20th century, where we started to think about mind, using the analogy of the mind as a computer, mm-hmm. I think AI brings brings us back to that too, like chat GPT. And I know there's debates and consciousness studies about what is the root? What is the source of consciousness itself, right? Mm-hmm. Is it that frontal lo- cortex where you're doing those calculations or is it in the amygdala? Mm-hmm. And is it springing from there, like our emotional center? I'm kind of in the amygdala camp mm-hmm. that from an evolutionary point of view, that it makes more sense that if we were to, uh, if consciousness were to evolve, it would evolve from an emotional place that would motivate us to move toward whatever need we are able to satisfy before we even became primates, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And what, and, and, and I guess to the source of consciousness and the mind and what AI can teach us about that? Mm-hmm. Well, I guess I would say that, you know, we're so identified with our conscious minds. We, we imagine that that's all there is. And, and from what scientists have been able to find out, it appears that consciousness is just one tiny little piece of all the mental activity that is going on in our brains all the time. Um, and so the limitation of identifying only with our conscious minds and only working with our conscious minds it is it lies in the fact that we actually know so much more than we can articulate than we can be right. conscious of and so working with the body um changing the environment in which we work you know drawing on the riches of interpersonal relationships those are all ways of tapping the deeper resources that we all have we're all carrying around within us um instead of relying on this rather thin layer, you know, of capacity that that is consciousness. Um, And then as far as AI goes, you know, I I, I probably should have said this earlier in our conversation, the idea of the extended mind for those of your listeners who maybe aren't familiar with it, it's an idea that was proposed by two philosophers, uh, Andy Clark and David Chalmers in 1998. So it's not my idea. I borrowed it. I thought it was too good to leave to the philosophers and their their journals, you know. Um, But um, Andy Clark is the one who really kind of took that idea and ran with it after that original co-authored paper. He's written several fantastic books um, like Natural Born Cyborgs and um, Supersizing the Mind that elaborate on this idea of the extended mind. And I love what he has to say about our tools in general. And I think this applies um, very well to, to artificial intelligence, which is after all, you know, a tool that we humans have created for ourselves. And, he talks about how Andy Clark talks about how humans are intrinsically loopy creatures, meaning that our particular brand of um, biological intelligence, it benefits from being looped outside of our brains through other media, you know, whether that's our bodies, through other entities, you know, through our bodies, through our physical spaces, through the minds of other people. Um, and that we should embrace that loopiness, you know, and embrace the fact that the more um, iterations we can make, the more loops we can make of our thinking through other media, um, including AI, the more enriched and enhanced our thinking will be. And it's, we're not losing anything. We're not, certainly not losing our humanity. This is the essence in many ways of being human is to to be extended, to be loopy. Um, And so, of course, there are all kinds of cautions and, um, you know, issues that we need to work out with AI that we're only beginning to think about at this point. But I, I tend to adopt Andy Clark's enthusiastic and optimistic notion that um, AI is another tool that is going to allow our own human biological intelligence to be enriched and enhanced. And, and I, I like, I prefer to think about it that way. Instead of a danger or something that's going to produce a loss, you know, it's actually um, another extension, if you will, of like, of what it means to be human. 
So you yeah. don't you don't foresee AI as our overlords within the next three years and <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've noticed one thing about your book, and I could be wrong because I don't have that kind of memory. I should probably move more when I read. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I feel like and maybe that there's this, you, you don't use the word subconscious, mu subconscious much in the book, I feel like. And is it, it, am I wrong about that? I feel like that we kind of, is that just too loosey goosey of a term? Is it kind of something that we should, that isn't relevant yeah. anymore? Well, subconscious, that term has some Freudian baggage, and that's probably why I um, avoided it. But I did, I did use the word non-conscious processing when I was talking right. about, I believe when I was talking about interoception and how kind of, as I was referring to before, we have, you know, as we make our way through our daily lives, we're collecting all of this information, all spotting and storing all these patterns in our experience. But if that were all to be conscious, you know, we would we could never store or process that kind of information on a on a um, a conscious level, and we'd never be able to get anything else done. So that that information comes, you know, it it enters us, but it's 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 not conscious, um, but it is there to be drawn upon. And then the question becomes, well, how do you access that information that is stored non consciously? And that's where the body comes in. You know, that's why we can find ourselves reacting, you know, getting nervous or getting excited, but not quite knowing why. I think we've all had that experience. It's because our yep. body has recognized some kind of pattern or event in our environment that is triggering a reaction based on what we've, the information we've, we've collected. Um, and again, it's like our conscious mind is the last one to know. It's the last one to, um, to make up a story about what we're experiencing and why, and our body is already like way ahead and often reacting before we even our conscious minds even know what's going on. Interesting. So one area I have background in is theater arts. Um, and when I was reading your book and, and, and even listening to you now, I keep coming back to a lot of theater principles because mm -hmm. a lot of theater principles are about embodiment um, and memory. And, you know, I'm thinking of, gestures for instance so stanislavski the great acting teacher mm -hmm. um had a concept called sense memory mm -hmm. where he'd encourage actors to create a gesture that would help them access a uh, past memory and so when you're on stage you you do that gesture and it's going to connect to your emotions and that memory as if you're living that experience again and, uh, you know, and I'm also thinking about there's also this idea of kinesthetic response, mm. which is a rehearsal process where you get a group of people together to practice movements together. So they almost become synchronized mm -hmm. in their movements and uh, in their interactions, almost like you were talking about, like we were talking about with walking and the synchronized, mm -hmm. synchronized walking. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking in terms of leadership and team building. Should leaders be thinking about these type of exercises? Should we be tapping into theater and uh, dance and other medium that use the body more to uh, break out of our our brain Descartes, our, our brain yeah. mode? Yeah. Oh, I I think so. I love the connection that you're making, Dan, to acting because um, you know, in a lot of ways. Uh, the extended mind is putting a philosophical and a scientific framework on things that people already know or already have figured out. And interestingly, I find that um, once, you know, the, the, my book, the extended mind went out into the world, one of the groups um, of readers who really responded to the book the most were, were artists, people in the arts, uh, actors. And yeah, I can see that. Artists, because they've been thinking with the body thinking with physical spaces and thinking in collaboration with other people all along. That's what the arts are all about, you know? So this was um, the extended mind can provide a kind of framework for what people have figured out um, in terms of hacking their own, you know, their own capacities, their own bodies, their own um, abilities um, to do good work. And so, yeah, I think um, it would be a great idea for leaders to think more in terms of, um, how, what am I communicating with my body here? Not just with my words, for example. How am I connecting with this person that I'm talking to? Not just in terms of, you know, not just verbally, but in terms of what I'm sensing in my own body um, that's basically reading off of, of, of their body. And this, this is something called 
social interoception, with, which I think is really fascinating. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, um, psychotherapists, you know, um, cl- clinical psychologists are trained to do this and are sort of champions of doing this, that they monitor their own bodies for sensations, feelings, um, impressions that are actually, they're actually sort of reading off the other person. Because when we, when we talk to another person, we very subtly mimic their facial expressions, their posture, their movements. And, um, you know, when you think about it, the brain is this kind of black box. It's like sealed inside our skulls and it doesn't, it's, it's, uh, it, it, we're not going to know what another person is feeling or thinking unless we use our own bodies and brains as an instrument, you know? And so some being open to something like social interoception, I think could make a leader or anyone who works with other people a much more sensitive and attuned to what that other person is experiencing. I mean, you know, I, and- I feel like this this is triggering some stuff I remember from the last chapter. Mm-hmm. And I had a question I was thinking it was as I was listening to chapter chapter nine. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was bringing it, trying to tie it back to chapter one, two and mm-hmm. three, mm-hmm. right? These, this, this, which is sort of introspective and one is the opposite. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I guess I have a, I had sort of like this silly question in my head is what is then the relationship between um, this, 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 aspect where we might be conveying more than we're <laughs> conscious yeah, physically realize. impact yeah. the the totality. And I thought, are we just a bunch of great apes actually being driven by <laughs> unconscious, <laughs> non-conscious be- physical behaviors and decisions yeah. are being made by all this motion that we're actually not acute to recognizing. Yeah. And, 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 a, and a final thought, and Dan and I just watched that documentary on Netflix with the chimps. And I started thinking about they're not talking with words. They must be talking with these gestures that you're that you're referring to. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, I'll leave it at that. Thoughts? Yeah, no, we, we are we are a bunch of overgrown chimps, right? I mean, we, um, <laughs> we animals have been communicating with each other, uh, uh, you know, in in ways that don't involve language, you know, for and and humans before we developed language communicated in that way, and yet we we now in our in our very modern um, conceptions of ourselves think that only only the words matter, you know, only the verbal expression matters. When really, so much more is being communicated um, through our gestures, through our movements, through um, even through uh, the surroundings that we place ourselves in and, and arrange. And you know, we're we're sending just this wealth of signals um, all the time. And I think it's it's. Uh, quite again, quite limiting and constraining to think that only our verbal expressions matter. Only our um, only the words that we say are are having an impact, um, and that by leaving out all of those other signals. And in fact, there's a, a cognitive scientist at MIT named uh, Sandy Pentland who wrote a book uh, titled "Honest Signals," and he he pointed out that a lot of those nonverbal signals are going to be much more reliable. Um, because people can't fake them, you know, um, because they're they're below conscious awareness, they're going to be a lot more reliable and informative than the words that people are crafting, you know. Um, and we are sort of all animals who are reading each other's um, signals all the time. And I think we've we've all had the experience of a kind of disjunction between those two things. Like we don't like someone, we don't trust them. They're saying all the right things, you know, but there's something else we're picking up on. <laughs> so I think it can be, it's it's wise for us to realize that um, words are not not the be all end all. I get that feeling when I'm talking to Dan all the time. It's weird. <laughs> uh, hey, Dan, yeah. Dan, Manny, can I do just a quick, <laughs> a quick follow up? Just a quick one. You triggered something since we are talking ads here. How much is that disrupting our ability to actually communicate, do you think, since this is just this virtual stuff? Oh, um, how much does it disrupt our ability to communicate to only have this kind of holistically impo- yeah. impoverished medium of, of Zoom or whatever? Yeah. Um, you know, I get asked that question a lot as we, you know, as we navigate this new world of kind of hybrid work. And of course, a lot of us are, are having many meetings online these days. And there's no, there's no question about how convenient they are, right? But there is a question about what do we lose when we're not interacting with people in person over time, um, as we might in an office or in other settings. And um, it, what what I, my read of the research suggests that there's two major losses, at least as as um, as scientists have been able to to determine. One is um, 
is trust, actually. The um, research appears to show yeah, that, I could see that groups, yeah, the groups that don't meet in person um, have, have a lower level of trust than groups that are meeting, um, seeing each other face to face. And I think that's because of these um, really rich cues and signals that uh, you know, get exchanged when we're around people in person, but but get flattened out, you know, when we're when we're on Zoom. Um, and the other is um, young people really lose out on all the um, yeah. implicit learning that goes on in a workplace. You know, it's not so much your boss telling you do this or do that. It's that you hear your boss talking, you observe your boss in a in a meeting, or you you see how groups of people interact and. If all you're having is this kind of direct, you know, cut and dried, let's talk about this task that, or this uh, project, you know, in a meet in a Zoom meeting, and then we're off doing our own thing. There's a whole lot of learning and um, uh, apprenticeship by osmosis, you know, that's not happening. So right. I, I would really love to see a return to being together. Um, I, I think there's no substitute for that. Not that it has to happen every day, five days a week, nine to five. I don't think we're going back to that world, but I think we do lose something when uh, our interactions are purely digital. Yeah, it may, it's interesting. I've been thinking about this a lot lately uh, because I work in a, a college. Mm -hmm. And so we're struggling with getting all the students back, right? Mm -hmm. Some are preferring to stay online because uh, I work at a community college mm -hmm. technically. So mm -hmm. it's not like a university where you have the housing built in. Mm -hmm. And so... We're, we have some students coming back to campus. Some are preferring to stay online. And, and, you know, I live in Seattle, the home of Amazon. And Amazon is now requiring all their workforce to come back three days a week. Mm -hmm. And that's creating all this congestion mm -hmm. and traffic uh, that we haven't seen for years. So some people are like saying, I'm not going back downtown mm -hmm. <laughs> anymore. Mm -hmm. So it might be having the opposite effect, trying to bring everyone back together. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I kind of find myself at, of two minds about it because on one level, I'm like, based on your book, you know, people find that nature is more restorative than like an urban environment. And like, hey, let's all move out to the country and, and fill up all that land that we're not <laughs> using in the middle the middle of the country and have everyone out in the forest so they can get res be restorative. But then they ha can only interact online, which has a limit limitation to it. Right. Uh, so it's a real struggle to see, you know, how could we build something that balances both that nature and, and all these different variables that are impacting our lives right now in this digital digital world that we're living in yeah. post pandemic. Yeah. And I would add how do we balance intensely collaborative and social and collective kinds of working and thinking together with the kind of deep work that um needs to be protected from exactly that kind of um you know distracting or um um uh pressure filled social exchanges. And by that, I mean, whenever people are together, there's there's a pressure for consensus and for agreeing with each other and um, kind of coming to, to a collective agreement. Whereas, you know, to get the most um, original and fresh ideas, we actually need to be kind of away from those kinds of social pressures because we are such social beings. The way to um, think for ourselves is to actually physically isolate ourselves to some extent. And that's why I find this idea that researchers have come up with of intermittent collaboration so appealing. You know, that mm, like we need to have both kinds of work in our lives. And we need to be thinking as a society of creating spaces that support both of those kinds of work of work uh, and thinking so, such that people can oscillate and go back and forth between those two um, ways of, of engaging the, the material that they're working on. And I, I think that the hybrid uh, situation could actually be supportive of something like that. If home were to be the place where you can go for a walk in the middle of the day, you can have quiet time where nobody's knocking on your door, but then you also are able to go in periodically to a place where you're gathering in person with your colleagues and having that intensely social and collaborative kind of um, experience, that might be the best of both worlds. Yeah, I feel like finding that balance is key. Right now, I, I, I do find working at home gives you that 
isolation you need mm -hmm. to be able to focus on more complex projects. And then when I'm on campus, definitely more into the social aspects of being on campus and um, engaging with people. Yeah. And I found, you know, the section of your book on physical spaces mm -hmm. really fascinating. Uh, the concept of walls mm -hmm. and privacy mm -hmm. and creating those isolated spaces and the cognitive load it takes when you're, you don't have walls and you're in a big social spot space and you're what observing other people and having to manage those social cues as right. well. Um, yeah, I found, do you want to speak a little bit about that? I found that section very fascinating. Yeah, actually that fits in really well with what we were just saying about intermittent collaboration because the, the fatal flaw of the open office, which, you know, I hope that the, the pandemic killed that off for good, although I'm sure it still exists in a lot of workplaces, but the fatal flaw of the open office was that we were expecting people to do deep, immersed, focused, concentrated work in a setting that made that all but impossible because there are all these social cues and distractions going on around them at all times. So if we can be more right. conscious and intentional about when we're with people, we're with people. And that it's what that's about is, is right. interacting with them and, um, you know, bouncing ideas off each other and, uh, and be, you know, having that in-person kind of electricity that only happens when you're, you're present with someone um, and not expecting people to, you know, this is why we had seas of people in open offices with their headphones on. I mean, it was, it was such, it's such a like <laughs> paradoxical situation where it's like, supposedly the open office was going to um, stimulate all this collaboration, but actually you had people just desperately trying to, <laughs> to like protect themselves and draw into their own little cocoons, you know? So I think we need to be really intentional about when are we with people and having this social kind of collaborative um, activity underway? And when are we protected from all that? Which, you know, as, as you were saying, Dan, is actually what walls are for. We actually need um, walls and physical obstacles to kind of protect our brains, which are wired to pay attention to anything novel, especially anything social yeah. in our environment. And we're just immediately going to get drawn to that if that's what's going on around us. We can't help it. Um, and so we need we need the um, the physical barriers of walls to protect our ability to concentrate. I liked your imagery of the monks walking around there. It was like horse blinders, right? And I could see <laughs> instead of these things on our phones at work, we all got these like things to keep us. I work in the um, in in the tech industry, and um, I have like Dan does probably with the the location uh, issue where he's kind of of split mind. I'm of split mind, not split mind. I I, I think I see it from both sides, but. Um, I've worked at very small companies, mm -hmm. very like we're just tiny, where we all did have a shared space. Mm -hmm. And it did feel in those cir circumstances, it did feel like a crack marine unit, right? Mm -hmm. Where we were in lockstep, we were, we were nudging each other and bumping and saying, hey, and someone would go up and write and we'd all look up when they wrote mm -hmm. and then would respond. There was, there was this team thing, this group thing where we mm -hmm. were breathing together. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, yes, I've also worked in these open floor plans where I'm surrounded. I'm not working with those that group, but they're there <laughs> and they're causing noise for me and signals and diversion. And perhaps I'll hear the joke they say, which is great, but it's not helping me get my job done. And so it does seem like there is a sweet spot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the, the final chapter of The Extended Mind, I talk about thinking with groups, you know, and... Um, the concept of groupiness, which believe it or not, is actually a term that psychologists use to describe a group, an assemblage of people becoming sort of one entity, you know, like a one. Oh, like yeah. one. And that sounds like what you're describing there, Joda, in terms of what what happened in those small tech companies that you were working with, They that actually you guys became one unit or one entity that was actually thinking as a whole in a very efficient and effective way, which is a really different thing, as you note, from having to overhear somebody else working on their project that has nothing to do with you and is just distracting you. You know, it's like two, it's, it's, right. it's people, people, to, it looks like the same situation, but it actually is qualitatively totally different. Yeah. I think leaders functionally sometimes don't recognize that mm -hmm. they just kind of throw everybody together. And then sometimes I think they expect people to automatically create their little silos, but it's um, probably doesn't manifest in the way they expect it. I'm mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think you have to be intentional about it if you're in a leadership position. I mean, we've talked about on the show collect, the idea of collective mm -hmm. cognition, getting groups of people together, and then through their dialogue, creating like almost this the sum of the parts are are more than the whole, mm -hmm. right? And um, or the whole is more than the sum of the parts, mm -hmm. rather. And as far as the the group thinking that's that's going on, so. Based on your research, what are some strategies leaders should be thinking about to create that groupiness mm -hmm. among, you know, team members? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, in general, my advice on that front is get people in the same place at the same time doing the same thing. Um, and that can be um, learning and training together. You know, I think it's, it's kind of crazy that um, this is an example I write about in the book that we put medical professionals from different specialties in a hospital and expect them to, to work together, you know, the anesthesiologist and the surgeon and the nurse and the social worker. And yet all of those people have been trained completely separately. Um, and we, we uh, this is changing a bit. Some medicine is addressing this problem and um, uh, arranging sort of group um, training scenarios where all of those different people are, are learning and training together. Um, but, and I think that's the kind of thing we need across a lot of different domains in our, in our workplaces. But um, it can also mean something like uh, engaging in rituals together. Um, and I'm thinking about oh, things wow. like sharing a meal together, taking a walk together, um, having emotional or meaningful experiences together. You know, this is another thing that is very hard to do on Zoom, but if you're a team who is um, who really is getting to know one another, who's really relating to other each other as people and not just as kind of coworkers, um, that can create a sense of that groupiness that um, that we're looking for. That can um, allow people to collaborate efficiently and effectively, in part by building what's known as a transactive memory system. That's when. Um, you don't, mm. you know, in our world that is so full of specialized information and knowledge and such abundant knowledge and information, no one person can know everything about what needs to be done for oh, yeah. by any means, right? But if you know who who else knows that information, if you know where to go, if you know that Joe in accounting is really the guy that you need to talk to, then you've effectively multiplied your own access to, to knowledge and information. And so really well-functioning and effective teams have a robust transactive memory system wherein everybody knows what other people know so that they have access to that hugely enlarged pool of information and knowledge um, that goes way beyond their own brains. So sticking with this group, this group thinking, um, we've got you, and then you're surrounded by other humans uh -huh. and they've got, and we're offloading cognitive mm -hmm. load on them, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is probably a good amount of trust that has to start to develop to, to mm -hmm. trust that they're, I don't need to think about that because they can handle that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we've also introduced in the past 20, 30 years, all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't remember a cell phone number anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like what are, what are the right. implications of technology of us offloading? How are any thoughts on that? This, this technology where we're, giving it even chat GTP, which we kind of referred to in the beginning, um, yeah. as far as part of the, is that now part of the group? Is that the team? Is this, are we, do we have a transactive memory system with our, with our smartphones? Yeah, I think that you can think about it that way. And in general, I think cognitive offloading, again, borrowing from the optimism of, of Andy Clark, I think cognitive offloading is a really good idea. Um, we, we do far too much in our heads and we, we, ad we admire and we valorize doing things in our heads. Um, you know, we admire like the chess champion who can think, you know, eight moves ahead in, in inside his own brain or the memory champion who can remember all the digits of pi, like, you know, without writing them down. But actually in our everyday lives, we want to be writing things down, getting them out of our heads, putting them on whiteboards, um, maybe giving them to chat GPT as much as possible because that frees up our minds uh, to do maybe the things that only human brains can do. You know, we're we're actually not that great at remembering um, things exactly. You know, we it's better to commit that to a calendar or to um, to a computer. But we humans are, you know, we're, we where we do excel is in creative thinking, higher level cognition, making making connections. You know, so the more we can reserve our limited brain power for those higher level activities, the better. I do think that, um, you know, there's interesting research about 
how having access to a search engine, for example, and I'm sure this will move into looking at AI as well, how having access to Google can inflate our sense of what we know. You know, we, we think it's in our heads because it's so easily available. And in some cases, we actually really do need that information in our heads. I'm thinking about students and how it's not enough to be able to Google, you know, um, the meaning of a... Or ask chat GPT. Yeah, you, need to... <laughs> yeah, you actually need a fair... When you're learning, especially um, before you've mastered a subject, and mastery actually is the storing of a whole lot of those that information and those structures in your own head. Um, you, you know, it's it's not enough to have access to the tools. You you have to know how to use them. And then you need a fair amount of that information and those structures committed to memory, which is, you know, maybe yeah, you have to have enough confidence to be able to improvise mm -hmm. in a given situation, right? As a test of your knowledge. Yeah, I, I come coming from education too, I you know, one of the areas I supervise is the tutoring services of a college. And I was fascinated by your your con your chapter on cognitive apprenticeship, because uh -huh. um, I feel like and, and we can even link this to AI because now we're seeing some AI tutor mm -hmm. bots that are being rolled out. MIT, thank you mm -hmm. very much. Um, that's a threat to like the human tutoring services. Mm -hmm. But I think what you have to say about uh, a cognitive apprenticeship mm -hmm. would would maybe argue that these chatbot tutors probably will not be as effective as a human mm -hmm. tutor. Would that be, and not, maybe not in all situations, would that be Certainly correct not or yet, not? You know, and I think we saw that during the pandemic and the switch to remote schooling. Um, you know, and of course that was done under uh, very difficult circumstances. So it wasn't a perfect test of, of educational technology, but I think the limitations of educational technology were exposed, were ruthlessly exposed during that, um, you know, that experience with remote education that children and uh, uh, people in general need to learn from other people, um, ideally people who they feel care about them, <laughs> you know, and um, a, a computer, uh, a computerized tutor is, is, can be helpful but um, but the essence of teaching and learning is still a human interaction. Um, so that's where that's where I stand on that. I mean, maybe maybe AI will get so much better that it'll prove me wrong. But that seems to be well. Um, stick, sticking with sticking uh, uh, sticking with Dan's question real quick. I, um, that thought the I wonder how much if s suggesting one that you agreeing with what you just said. How much is it that? Perhaps again, the physicality, the lack of physicality mm -hmm. that one has mm -hmm. with an engagement with the, with a AI mm -hmm. unit mm -hmm. is important. That again, if we're talking about our memory is stored so much in our in our facilitation of our kinetic body, yeah, that's not part of the story when you're doing these yeah. virtual things. So, yeah. is that perhaps late lending? credence or more strength to what you just said, your response to Dan's question. I think so. <laughs> of course, um, it's not out of the question that um, the designers of technology could begin to to build more physical activity and physical um, awareness into their um, into their creations. I think it's telling that we haven't really seen that so far, that in fact, um, technology itself is highly brain bound. You know, we kind of, tr we, we yeah. act as if technology is yeah. only interacting with our brains. Um, and it's like this, we, we can't get out of this hall of mirrors where our brains are like computers and our computers are like brains, you know, when really there is all these, all these other resources that help us think and learn and create in the real world that are being left on the table. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the arguments about, the limitations of using a chat bot for sense making or advice is that the chat bot probably the AI agent is probably going to be very ruthless mm. because they don't have a sense of empathy. Again, going back to where does our mind spring from and the emotional factor in that they have the feelings. It's not going to have that. It's not going to be able to make sense of the world through empathy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just going to do a do the calculus and say, okay, well, just lay off mm -hmm. all those people mm -hmm. or whatever the decision you're trying to come to might be with an AI mm -hmm. bot. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I imagine, you know, expressions of empathy could be programmed into an AI chatbot, but would they feel genuine? You know, I mean, there's, <laughs> well, as, as you know, Dan, from your work in education, so much of teaching and learning is about motivation and getting people, getting students to care and yeah. to invest and to engage in what they're doing. And I think that's as far as I can see, always going to be a human specialty rather than something that computers are good at. Yeah, I feel I feel that way too, and I think that's it's one of the reasons I'm not super threatened <laughs> in education uh, by Chat GPT or any of the AI uh, innovations that are coming down the line. I do think we're going to need to use them as tools; like we can't escape them. They're going to be integrated into Microsoft Office and a lot of other applications in the coming years. And so I think for me, when I'm talking to educators and staff about it now, it's like, well, okay, it's here. How do we teach people how to use it? How do we teach people mm -hmm. ethically how mm -hmm. to incorporate uh, these AI tools into their learning? Uh, but I think the human factor is always going to be necessary, mm -hmm. um, which I guess brings us back to cognitive apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. You know, what is that? Can you explain mm. for the listeners what the, what cognitive apprenticeship is and how as people leading teams, we should, we could use that knowledge to, to better train our yeah, staff. Yeah. Yeah. So cognitive apprenticeship, you know, clearly from, from the language used there is building off of traditional apprenticeships, which involved a very physical, very, um, concrete kind of demonstration by the master, the person who was skill, already skilled at, at whatever the task was, you know, whether it was a carpenter or a shipbuilder or a tailor, um, demonstrating for the apprentice uh, what needed to be done and uh, supervising the apprentice as um, the apprentice attempted that same maneuver themselves. All of that was, those were physical actions that could be observed and emulated, but so much of what we expect students and workers to do these days is, is internal, is inside the head. And that requires a whole new approach to teaching and learning. And that, that's why the idea of a cognitive apprenticeship sprang up. And what that involves, it's actually a kind of cognitive offloading because we, in order for any novice or beginner to, to learn to do what the master does, the master needs to get all of that information and all of those skills out of their heads and make them in some way visible and legible to the to the novice but that's easier said than done in part because of the nature of expertise you know the reason that an expert is able to do something so easily and efficiently and almost without um without really thinking about it is because they've they've automatized all those mental processes. That's what makes an expert. They don't have to laboriously kind of go through each step. It all happens very quickly right. and below consciousness. So that makes it actually really difficult for an expert to explain uh, in words exactly what they're doing um, for the benefit of a, of, a, of a novice. So, you know, when you think about how our whole education system and much of our workplace uh, training systems are based on this an expert teaches a novice model, there's this inherent problem of how, but how does an expert, you know, make their knowledge uh, legible to, to, to a beginner? Um, and that's, that's where um, some of the, the research around a cognitive apprenticeship comes in. Yeah, I, I, I've seen that with our math tutoring program, where you have students who are on the upper levels of calculus, you know, and trigonometry, you put them with a student who's at the very beginning algebra level of math and they can't help them because they've advanced so far out of that realm. It's very difficult for them to go back and explain the right, basics. Right. Sometimes it can be, this is the beauty of um, near peer tutoring. It can actually be a student who's just a few steps beyond where the student, yep. the other student is, who can be the most helpful because they remember and can put them, they remember what it was like to struggle with that same material and they can put themselves in the shoes of that, that, uh, that beginner student. I'd like, I'm going to do a quick divert and go back to interoception for a second. I remember listening to an NPR program years ago about, uh, the people who are about saying that people who are stoned drive better than those who are not stoned. <laughs> and they asked them, yep, NPR did. Yeah, it was, it was an NPR, I swear. Yeah. 
And uh, I loved it, but it made sense. They were basically the, they, I remember they asked a stoner. They said, uh, uh, a guy, you know, he said, Hey man, I, you know, it's, it's, it's it, it, it harshes my high to tailgate. I just want to, you know, they're all dry. The average speed was like five miles below the speed limit. It was a Canadian study. And um, there's a point to this. So uh, it makes me think about the point of our decision-making and a lot of, I feel like a lot of parts of the chapter kind of always would come back to our ability to make a decision and how we make decisions in life. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I found interesting was the notion of space, how we can, when we feel like when we're in our own space, we get emboldened, mm -hmm. I think would be the word to say. Yes. But the other thing I thought was interesting was the meditation or the people who had strong sense of interception of, 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 of their body. Yes. Which would assume, I would say, would assume in a, ra a relaxed position. I don't know. I'm just mm -hmm. going to say that. Maybe you did say that in the book. That they come, And then you said that they were willing, the meditators were willing to, to accept asymmetrical deals more often than those who, what is that saying exactly? That, that people who meditate, like, don't care. I don't care. I'll, I'll, you know, what, what does that mean? What, what is it? What, what are we, well, we gleaning for that? You know, the, the deals that they were being offered was, it was part of a kind of economic game. You know, one of these, um, one person in a pair gets a pot of money and gets to, to distribute it however they want. And um, if you're the other person, taking any money at all is the rational choice, you know, because that's money that you didn't have before. But because we're social beings with ideas about how people should relate to each other, sometimes if... Um, if the original partner uh, with the pot of money doesn't split it evenly or splits it in such a unbalanced way that they're only giving a little bit to their partner, that partner will, will get angry and um, sort of it, it, to spite the other person will say, I don't, I reject that offer. I don't, I won't take it, which is the irrational position, you know, because they're, they're rejecting money that they could have had otherwise. Yeah. Um, that it's a kind of species of overthinking it. You know, you're kind of like um, getting mm -hmm. too much in your own head and not looking at, at what would really be best for you. Whereas yeah. the people who were meditators and had therefore built up this sense of, of their interoceptive awareness and were able to rest more in their body's reactions rather than in their, their brains sort of, um, you know, knee jerk kind of reactions and um, they were they were much more um willing and apt to inclined to accept whatever um uh amount of money their partner was willing to give them so in this case the body was actually more rational than the brain and i i'm not totally sure how that relates to the pot smoking driver <laughs> <laughs> me neither me, me i was smoking some pot before this <laughs> you just want to get that story in <laughs> busted <laughs> but i guess to, to, to kind of summarize this episode we we need to listen to our bodies more we need to listen to our and pay attention to our spaces uh more and so um so yeah and murphy paul thank you for being on the sense of thank signal you. podcast and how can people find you uh, if they want to buy your book we'll put uh, links in the show notes yeah. for sure but how uh, can people find yeah, you and contact yeah so you? i'm on twitter if anyone wants to seek me out there i'm at, at annie murphy paul um i have a Substack newsletter which is uh devoted to my current obsession which is creativity it's called the science of creativity newsletter um oh nice. yeah and i have a website uh www.anniemurphypaul.com um but thanks for having me on the show it's been really fun fantastic thank you so much yeah, yeah thank you great so book. much definitely read the book fascinating folks.